live from the 2014 AES show in Los Angeles, California. Audio Technica presents Ask Me Anything. And now, here is your host and moderator, Jeff Simcox. Okay, here we are. Wow. Welcome to our second session welcome, uh, welcome. of the second day of AES here in the Audio Technica booth. We are honored to have Dave and Herb here from Pensado's Place. Yay. As if uh, <laughs> as if they need an introduction, I will do a little bit of an introduction anyway just for everybody out there who, who's watching this via live stream. Uh, each week, Grammy Award winning mixing, mixing engineer Dave Pensado along with, with his co-host and executive Herb. producer Herb Trewitt broadcast the hit web show Pensado's Place where they discuss all things music and audio with a variety of guests from the industry. Uh, both uh, Dave and Herb have a long history in the music business and each bring a unique point of view to the show. Pensado has worked with a diverse array, uh, array of artists over the years including big names like Beyonce, Christina Aguilera, Kelly Clarkson, Mariah Carey, Elton John, Lionel Richie, Maroon 5, while Herb Trawick has extensive management experience in the industry <laughs> which he uses to supplement Pensado's technical advice with his business Damn. savvy insights. So, if everyone will please welcome me and welcoming Dave hey and Herb to How the booth. Are you? How are you guys? How are you guys at home? Good to see you as well. Good to see you as well, too. So, so what we're going to do, um, we are taking questions. It's the Ask Me Anything format. Uh, we're taking questions via Twitter and from people here uh, on the show floor. The people here on the show floor, to encourage questions, we have a crew of people in the back room watching you. And over the course of, uh, of the uh, questioning, they will determine who asks the best question, and that person will receive an Audio-Technica ATH M50X headphone. Whoa, whoa. Of which I want a pair and don't have a pair yet. And then I think we're going to give away a couple of books to good questioners as well, too, for free. So don't get mad if you pay 20 bucks at the corner. These are for people who didn't have the bread. So we're, we're good. So prizes. We, every place Pensado goes, there's prizes. When Audio Technica and Pensado hook up, people get stuff. So cool. I'll trade four of these for a 50-45. What a great deal. <laughs> That's a bad deal. That's a bad deal. Okay. I'll sign them and trade them for a <laughs> pair of 50 headphones. Oh, okay. All we'll right. work that yeah, out. There you go. So, who would like, who has a question? Here we go. Fire Let's away, get this man. rolling. Absolutely. This is a live sound question. Uh-huh. Um, I find, well, incidentally, we have three Audio-Technica 2050s. Oh, great mics. For our um, choir at church. Great. Uh, we run into a problem, though. While capturing the, um, the actual performance, we run into problems with extra noise coming from the wedges since obviously it's live and we don't have everyone wearing headphones right you know there's um, right. a problem with the music going into the choir mics right and we're just wondering if there's a way to actually cut that down with gating limiting well, anything like that there is what i would try first is 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 go to the audio, audio technical website and look for mics that have a uh, a, a hypercardioid or a cardioid pattern because you want to re reject from the back. And before you go to gating, experiment with some uh, with with phase manipulation. So, if you've got, if you can find a place where the mic is out of phase with the monitors, then it'll cancel out for you. That's, come on, give me a hand. Give me a hand for that. That was good. Good answer, right? And then and then you can rely on stuff like gating and all that. Are you are you are you recording the service and then immediately handing it to the to the to the attendees as they leave, or do you have time to clean it up later? Well, I mean, you know, you can you can draw out some of the stuff. You can you, there's a lot of plugins you can use. Isotope makes some good ones. I would I would my first choice would be a good cardioid pattern that, that's known for rejecting what's um, you know what's on this side of the microphone. Are you Hold on a second. Watch this. Check, check, check. Check, check, check. Rejection, right? That's what you're looking for. We have a way we don't have any high What would you recommend we do? Well, uh, you know what? I can't remember the model numbers for Wave. It's an N something. 
of course, Isotopes RX4. But I think you can solve the problem with just mic placement and, and making sure that, uh, that your phase correlations between all the things that you're trying to, to get to come through. And, and <clears throat> Thanks one, for the question, The my other friend. thing that you may, if, if none of that works, just get a twizzle flanger. <laughs> if, if you need to know where to get that, just contact us. We'll get you a twizzle flanger. That'll fix all your problems. Cool. All right. That Thanks was savvy, question. Herb. We have another one. Uh, with, with the advent of home recording, uh, a lot of the drum tracks that, uh, that I mix have a lot of bleed through on toms. And where toms have cymbals and snares, what are you using um, to automate the editing of that process so you well, get decent tracks? let me back up a little bit. And I want more questions for her, but um, you're assuming that having bleed from mics is bad. It's not bad. It, it, it's just how you handle it. Uh, if you if you remember our dear dear friend Al Schmidt, he always records in Omni, the ultimate non-rejecting pattern on a microphone. So I wouldn't. I would first start trying to figure out how to make all the ambience that every particular mic is picking up work. Um, I just recently, Herb and I recently did a show with Matt Laniche, and he 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 likes the all that. So I'm not being a smart ass, but but. The first thing is to understand that that's not a bad thing, and then after that, if after that point, sometimes I'll I'll go through and and, and draw down and automate the ambience, the, the 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 spots where there's no some where there's nothing playing on that track. I'll automate some of those down. If you take everything out, you've just got a program drum kit. So it's more a question of trying to figure out how to use that on a musical level, and. Um, you can automate it. Uh, there's some plugins uh, here again. There's there's a, a couple of uh, uh, a new company. Acon makes some. I, I don't want to sound like this. Is, I'm here to talk about microphones, but our friends at Isotope make some good products. But there's a lot of D reverbers, you know, the, and the, that you, that I actually use a lot. Those work too. My first choice is to do it in a musical way. I don't want. I don't want a piece of gear or a plug-in making sonic decisions for me. I like to make them myself, so I like to draw it out. Is, is that a good answer? Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Questions? Questions? It's oh. a question for Herb, uh, um, you know, because I've been watching you guys for, for a while. How many of those polo shirts do you actually own? <laughs> uh, um, you know what? New contest. Go watch episode one through eighty nine and count the different number of shirts. Whoever gets the closest wins nothing. I've seen the blue one twice. <laughs> I have recycled a few, <laughs> but I've recycled a few over five years. So that's that's pretty good. Um, I own them all, and uh, felt obligated to start buying them about three months in because people would send calendars to us with all of the polo shoot. And when I don't wear them, we hear about it. And so, um, and I have polo sweaters and polo. What I don't have yet, which Robbie and Lisa I'm gonna to talk to about who worked public relations with us we recently, they're like brothers and sisters, is a polo endorsement. So I don't have to pay for all those because polo gear is going to about a million people a month for nothing. And they give people polo shirts for way less than that. So maybe we're going to have to garner together, and you guys at home as well, too, a whole polo movement. I'll get somebody to hit you and hit them hard and say, why doesn't Herb have polo shirts on Pensado's place? So, all right, so family, we're going to pull that together. We'll get information to you, and then when I get it, then I'm going to get polo shirts for other people, too, as well. So I probably have 50-some-odd polo shirts, literally. And by the way, for those of you that care, I'm working on my wall, uh, Walmart endorsement, so I can hook some of you guys up. You look like you could use help. So thank you for that. All right, thank you for the question. Did you have one? <clears throat> Dave, um, you've said multiple times that you like to uh, use the rule of thirds while mixing. Um, could you expand on that a little bit? I can. Um, I don't know if this is the right format for it. I'm going to give you a two-part answer, the, the smart-ass part first and then a real answer second. If I, if, I, if I tell you exactly what I mean by the rule of thirds, 
it doesn't apply directly to audio. So I might steer you in the wrong direction. When I talk about the rule of thirds as applied to mixing, I'm talking about a metaphoric balance between the audio elements, much like there's a pleasing balance when you apply that rule to, to painting and to the visual. And, and I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't, stop me when I get too long here, but um, I, I believe firmly that the brain assimilates audio information like it does visual information. And if you want to understand what's going in, on in audio, use your eyes and, and see what, how you see, and then, and then the audio world is the same way. So it, it's, it's not a directly one-to-one -one correlation between the visual world and the audio world. It's more the visual world makes you feel like if, if you divide a painting in equal thirds vertically and equal thirds horizontally, those nodes, the four nodes where those meet is the most pleasing place to put something in a photo. It's less pleasing to put something dead center in a photo. And so conceptually and metaphorically apply that to the mix. So it can be a front to rear thing that you're using at the same time you're using panning. So, so, but be careful. The reason I don't like to say this too much is because you don't want total balance in a mix. You don't want, if something's over here, something's gotta be over here. If something's, so think about it and, and next time we talk, catch me and, and we'll go over your progress because there is an answer it's a little hard to explain and it by definition it's going to be nebulous because it's not a direct correlation okay and, and, and ultimately what we hear from a lot of the pros that are on our panel is whatever methodology you use whatever science you apply to what you do you always have to maintain your gut you always have yeah. to it's why the answer about bleed was how to turn that into something of character Sometimes the mistake is the thing that makes your thing stand out. So don't look at things as problems. Look at them as things to utilize to get to other solutions that give you a definitive signature. Like when something makes you go, oh, maybe you turn that. I mean, look, we turned a medical, a brain incident into a very popular web show. That should have stopped everybody. Do you know what I'm saying? So when you apply that to your music, sometimes that very thing that might be a problem might be actually an answer to give you a certain kind of definition. So, so, so think in terms of possibilities as opposed, think in terms of yes as opposed to no. Well said. Well Makes said. sense? Cool. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Somebody over here had something? Yeah. Uh, I guess real quick for Herb. Yep. Um, how would somebody get into artist management if they didn't have experience with that? I've come from the technical recording engineering side, you know, mixing stuff. But right. if you want to get into the, you know, management tech side, right. what would be well, an avenue to start with if you want to well, do that? Well, the first avenue is to have yourself committed to a crazy house. Um, just, just, <laughs> no. Uh, management is um, something that I think <laughs> there's an intuitive kind of thing that happens as you're coming up through your career. And you have to be, you have to have sort of a big view, but understand really specified detail. It's like a chess game. Uh, let's make a sports analogy. A manager is a little bit of a combination of the coach and the quarterback. The, and, the, and the quarterback has a running back that's a bigger star. So sometimes you're calling a play from off the field. Sometimes you have to call the audible on the field. And you have to have the kind of leadership skills where people will trust your call and then go out and execute. So you kind of have to look into your own soul first and see if you're constructed that way because it's a lot of detailed stuff. It takes time to learn. It's changing. But it's very rewarding when you do it well. I mean, you know, I've had a really great management career, but all management careers go like this, like most careers. Um, I think once you check off those boxes, then the next step would be either with an agency, a different management company, a publishing company, get inside a company for a minute to see how it looks in the big scale, and then you can take your skills out and apply them independently your way. Does that make sense? Okay, we can talk about it some more too. Okay, sure. All right. Uh, from a producer standpoint, uh, as a, from a, you know, and you being an engineer, when do you, how often do you take a producer's record and manipulate it and like basically if they had 27 sounds and you cut it to 13 to actually daily uh you know bring bring out the character more uh by reducing more than adding or even uh, manipulating okay let's go let's let's go a little farther back up the process before i take a record before i uh agree to work on a record 
Herb has to like it, and then if Herb likes it, then he passes it on to me. If I feel something, if I feel like I can bring something to to finish the producer's vision, then, then, then I'll pile on. And then at that point in time, now we're going to start to answer your question. Uh, I don't look at the process quite like that because, see, I'm not creating anything. I'm, I'm putting my taste towards finishing the vision of what was created. So I, I finish the vision, and my, my creativity goes towards that goal. Now, whatever it takes to, to finish that vision within the framework and context of what the producer and artist wanted, uh, I do that. Now, when I started my career, a lot of people didn't want what I did because why would they? I had no success. As I've gotten more successful, they give me a little more latitude to inflict my taste on it. And so every client has a different tolerance for the amount of my taste I inflict on them, right, Herb? <laughs> well, I, I can tell you from a personal. So when I managed, I managed an R&B singer named Brian McKnight for a lot of years. Uh, sorry, I mean, and we were very successful. Um, but I had the kind of relationship with Dave, and more importantly, Brian had the kind of relationship with Dave that we looked for him to manipulate the record. And we stayed out of the way because we trusted his judgment. Dave's particular forte is to take any genre record and make it pop friendly. Never loses the integrity of the genre. Could be as black as you want it to be, could be country, could be indie alternative, but his sensibility about how to make that a radio record without losing the integrity is unlike, there's maybe a couple other guys who can do that as well. So what we felt like because he was a radio act was let Dave do his magic a little bit as a producer with Leeway, then we could come in with fresh ears and hear it. The other thing I think is important to understand is um, when you as a producer have that relationship with somebody, it's, it's, it's important to sort of trust it because it will go someplace that for a minute might be uncomfortable, but it might end up in some place where it's really, really cool. Yeah, and, and you gotta find that thing because you won't know till they get there. So oftentimes our process is, when I got back involved with Managing Dave, which was about when we started the show, I, when clients reach out for me, if I think it makes sense schedule-wise and a lot of other reasons, the first thing we do is we do a creative call with the client. And then in that discussion, all the chemical stuff is talked about, <clears throat> all the directional stuff is talked about, time frames are talked about, deadlines are being talked about, and so that they go into the process understanding Dave's going to need some time alone because I hate people sitting on top of Dave at the beginning, and they're not freaked out about that. And then Dave will let them know when they can come in. So we set the table, which also starts the trust. And they go, oh, okay, they, they take, and that just seemed to me to be good client services. It also, yeah. more importantly, makes his life easier. Then he can mix to his strength. Well, they, they just work it out together, and then they have yeah. a one-on-one -on -one relationship. No, I like, I like conflict. I like discussion. I, I, you show me a happy environment, and I'll show you a non-creative environment. Uh, but at the end of the day, I'm being paid to execute their vision. Mm -hmm. Now, part of your question was completely physical. How do I get a session with 200 tracks, which is like a lot of them are? <laughs> no. <laughs> Guys, my mentor, Alan Myerson, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for that cat. The greatest mixer ever. Huh? Look over beside Chongor. Look who that is. No, Mike Clink. Oh, my Lord. So for all of Mike. you guys at home, around us are just absolute studs. Alan Myerson over here, who's just a film genius. Mike Clink over there, who's seminal rock record stands Guns the test Roses. of time. All the Guns um, N' Roses records. I mean, look, we're, we wish you were here. But let me, let me finish this real quick. We'll move on. I can't do this in front of Mike. Al Schmidt is to the left. Rose Cherney is to the left. Ed Cherney. Oh, to what's the up? I, I, <laughs> I can't hear me. I, I like to mix. I don't like to see a lot of physical tracks in front of me. It's much easier to work with fewer numbers of tracks. So I might have Cole bounce down the backgrounds. Like I might have 30 tracks of backgrounds. I want to just see maybe eight. If I've got like... Uh, 60 tracks of live strings. I might do the cello. I might do the. I might get it down to about eight. So I think that was part of your question. 
I don't change anything. I just like to see less information because I can't mix something until I memorize every single part of every single track. I got to have all that in my head so that I know when to bring them in and when to bring them up and how to massage the energy and make it flow. So uh, sometimes sometimes the bounce will need a, a and by the way, I, 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 I pay attention to this. I think you'll like this. Um, I'll, I'll keep the high harmonies separate from the mid harmonies, separate from the low. When I'm in the first chorus, I don't want to give all my energy away, so I'll take the high harmonies and tuck them a little bit, and I'll take the low harmonies and bring them a little lower too. Now the second chorus, I'll bring in the low harmonies to normal, and I'll bring in the high harmonies to about 90%. And when I get to the hook, I turn the high harmonies up, I turn the, all the backs up a little bit, I take my master fader, I turn that up, when they come out of that bridge listening to it and go into that hook, they ought to be halfway there to iTunes to buy it. I don't want to be subtle. I want to hit them over the head with a sledgehammer. So when I'm bouncing all these things down, I try to make sure I still have the individual components where I can massage the energy. And I don't want any more questions for me. I want Herb to get all the questions the rest of the day. Uh, 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 Al Schmidt, oh, my Sean God. Gore, get the picture of these three, please. How do you, how do you not get – yeah, Sean Gore, did you get it? You got Al and Dave and Mike. Well, how do you do that when you're behind them? We don't want oh. the back of their heads. So here's Al Schmidt, Alan Meyerson, Mike Klink. I'm telling you, all you guys at home, you should be here. These are friends of the family, and we are thrilled to have them around. Guys, let me tell you something. I, 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 these two guys I love. Meyerson, I respected him so much. Alan, Alan, tell, tell them this is the truth. I loved Meyerson so much. I met him. He went and bought a red 300ZX twin turbo. I thought it would make me a better mixer, so I went and bought one the same day. Did, r true story, right, Alan? I and, really wanted to be Alan Myerson. And by the way, Mike Klink is standing behind them being very – Mike, raise your hand and, and wave into the camera. That is a stud, gentlemen. That is an, those are three studs right there who absolutely changed your life as music makers and mixers. Uh, Alan did Call of Duty, Mike did Guns N' Roses. This, these are some bad boys. Um, all right, next question. Sorry, Jeff. That's all right. Next question. Who's got one? I apologize, Dave. This one's for you. But okay. <laughs> oh, man, um, I'm out of here. No, I'm just here. I'm just so teasing. when would you use, distor uh, should you use distortion in a live environment? Uh, next question. What would you use distortion most on? during a mix and what would you use it least on? Okay, I'm gonna answer a different question. I'm gonna answer the question, what is distortion? Now distortion can be described as a square wave, right? Now this is gonna be hard because I left my hand puppets at home. But if I, if I have a sine wave and I add the octave to that sine wave, it goes like this. Now with the octave added in, it goes like this and I've got an exact replica of the sine wave but half the l wavelength same thing down here on the bottom now if I keep doing that I end up with a square wave now what does that tell you a square wave is a rich collection of sine waves sine waves can be thought of in the physics world this isn't an accurate sentence they can be thought of as a collection of harmonics right so when you use the word distortion you think elephant man, but don't think elephant man. Always think a rich collection of harmonics. So if you want to enrich the harmonic content of something, then you add a rich collection of harmonics. So you add distortion. I don't like that word. So what we like about a lot of things in the, in the audio world, particularly in the analog side of the world, is how they manipulate those harmonics. And we actually have a measurement for that. We call it harmonic distortion as opposed to other types of distortion. So now that you know what it is, now you kind of know how to use it. So let's say I can't quite find a bass in my mix. So I listened to Alan Myerson's records. I realized that he added a little color. It sounded to me like he took the, the gain knob on an SSL and cranked it up a little bit. actually put it in an LA 2 and <laughs> so he got tube saturation or distortion. And, 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 and so what you do is you add a little color to that. It helps your ear find it in the mix, right? So now that's, now instead of, tell, instead, of, instead of giving you a fish, we're trying to hand you a, an Alan Meyerson fishing rod here. And, and so 
on vocals sometimes you want clarity like say we got a piano vocal you would approach that differently than if you've got um, a, a rock mix you'd approach that differently or a pop mix so the tolerance and the level for the amount of color you add back into the vocal varies now a way I solve that problem is, is I I treat that dis that distortion I might be using sound toys decapitator I might be using a culture vulture a real one or, or the UAD one there's multiple sources for that Alan just mentioned an LA 2A I didn't see anybody pull out a pad and write that down uh, although I made a note of it and um, so think of it as a, a parallel into it so in other words use a send and send into it that way you can control the amount yourself that you want never let a piece of audio gear make sonic decisions for you take control you make the decisions and you control the gear. So, so, am I coming close to answering your question? Well, you can't answer that question because you have to. You have to bring me the track, and I can tell you it varies from song to song. And the beauty of that is you get to control that decision. When you control it really well, like a bunch of these people to my left, you become a millionaire. When you're learning, you make a little less money. So that's a creative decision that only you can make based on your taste and the material you're working on. I use it a lot on bass, I use it a lot on vocals, I use it a lot on strings. Anything I want to sit in the mix front to rear a little differently, I can control that spatiality with, with ambience. I love early reflections, I love some reverbs, but that saturation can help you do that too, but in a different way. By the way, I'm sorry Herb, you didn't cut me off so I'm gonna keep going. Lately, I've been having so I'm much fun to. taking saturation plugins like AC2, like Decapitator, and I'm not using them for saturation. I'm using using them for EQ, like uh, the Crane Song Phoenix. And so, instead of instead of adding top end to a hi hat, I might I might use a saturation plugin to bring the top end in. And then uh, there's a couple of plugins with Isotope. Not only can you do that, but you can control the width of that. So I can actually saturate a portion of the frequency spectrum and widen it or narrow it. But those are advanced techniques. You could hurt yourself, ease into this stuff slowly. What you're hearing consistently is that your problems are not necessarily problems. It's how you analyze it and then what you do with that once you analyze it. Then you can sort of reapply it in such a way that your problem turns into a solution. Does that make sense?